Thank you, everyone, for joining us today. Really appreciate it. Uh, my name is Ali, uh, and I am from Chubal. Um We put a lot of work into these webinars. Uh, we don't like to do really salesy webinars. We like to get our friends to join us and uh, hopefully teach you something new. And that's what we've done this month. We're really excited about um, this month's webinar. It's uh, Accelerate Big Data Application Development with Cascading and Cubal. Uh, before I get into the introductions, um, just a couple of housekeeping notes. Uh, first of all, um, we love when you guys ask questions, and we allot some time at the end of the webinar as always to answer your questions. So um, if you have any questions over the course of the webinar, you should see a chat window on the bottom left of your screen. Please feel free to ask your questions uh, as we go along with the webinar. We'll be keeping track of them, and we'll address as many as we can at the end of the webinar. So keep an eye on that bottom left chat window um, to, to ask a question at any point. Also, um, we will be uh, sending out an email after the webinar. Uh, we'll be including some of the slides from the presentation. Um, and so if you have any other questions or follow-up, just feel free to respond to those emails that you get after the webinar. We'll, we'll also have a recording of the, uh, of the whole webinar. If you want to reference it again later or send it to somebody else, we'll have that available as well. But, um, all of that said, uh, again, it's, it, this, is a, this is a great webinar. It generated a lot of interest this month. Um, uh, what we have for you today is a pretty informative webinar with a nice demo um, also, so you can see how all this stuff works together. And uh, we have two presenters for you. The first is Dhruv Kumar, who is a solutions architect at Concurrent. Um, he has over six years of diverse software development experience, big data, uh, high performance computing applications. Um, before he went to Concurrent, he worked at Terracotta as a software engineer. Uh, we also have Ashish Dubey, uh, who is a solutions architect over at Cubal. Um, he's worked in the industry for more than 10 years. Uh, prior to Cubal, he spent several years at Microsoft as a major contributor to uh, Windows XP SV3 development. Um, so, really talented and seasoned guys here who are ready to uh, help you with. Uh, understanding how to accelerate big data app development. So without any further ado, I'm going to pass it off to Drew Kumar. Thank you, Ali, for that great introduction. Hi, guys. Welcome to this webinar. In this webinar, I'll be taking you through the cascading portion, how you can use cascading to accelerate your big data application development. Now, for some of you who may not know, cascading is provided by Concurrent, which is a company founded in 2008 headquartered in San Francisco. Cascading was developed initially by Chris Wenzel, who had two key observations about the big data landscape. Number one, it is very hard to find skilled MapReduce Hadoop developers which can write big data applications. There are a lot of Java developers out there, but not many MapReduce app developers. The second key observation is, that while Hadoop may be the interesting choice of big data app development now, it is being used everywhere, tomorrow something else may come up. So the investment which you make in your big data apps should be future-proof. They should be agnostic of the underlying technology platform on which they are supposed to run. So hence, cascading was constructed in a way to solve both these problems. The other key product from Concurrent is Driven, which is an application performance monitoring tool. Because cascading is so simple to use, it is used by a lot, lots of enterprises. Over 7,000 deployments are there. One of the key examples of cascading in production is Twitter, which uses a layer of Scala on top of cascading. Now, because cascading is a Java API, it is very easy to write other JVM-based languages on top of it. So for instance, if you put Scala on top of cascading, it becomes Scalding, which Twitter uses internally to do ad quality, user experience, and revenue application. It comes, Scalding is really powerful because it allows Twitter engineers to program in their language of choice, which is Scala. As you know, uh, Twitter uses a lot of Scala internally for their development work. In a few lines of code, you can create these very, very expressive workflows which do things all the way from machine learning to ETL. And this is all possible because of the expressiveness provided by the cascading API. 
even these observations, one, let's take a look, take a step back and see what does an enterprise in today's world need from a framework which allows it to do big data app development. You see, it is very easy to get started with ad hoc scripts and analysis, but as the complexity of your app grows, you quickly find yourself in trouble because now the tool which you started with doesn't give you the, the degrees of freedom to solve more complex problems. Here, cascading shines because it makes easy things very easy to use simple. And as your complexity of your app grows, it gives you the tools to tackle those problems at scale. Not only that, it is very easy, it is very easy to swap out the underlying execution framework in cascading. So today you're running on Hadoop, but tomorrow if your SLA requirements change, you may find yourself swapping the, the, the underlying execution framework out. So it is very easy, once you write in cascading, to go to a different platform. Further, you need a tool which allows you to look into the execution blocks of your application, see how they are performing, what is the runtime characteristic of those logical blocks, so that you can meet your SLAs and also improve on your operational characteristics. Let's quickly dive into a Hello World example for big data, which is a favorite word count application. So this slide shows you how easy it is to write a simple application in cascading. In the center of this slide, you see the processing block. That is where the logic, the business logic of the word count is executed. You see over here, I am not concerned with MapReduce at all. What I'm doing is thinking in terms of metaphors which I have learned while initially learning how to program, which is Unix pipeline. So if you even look at the book Hadoop, The Definitive Guide, the, chap the book opens up with similar constructs like grep, filter, sort, etc. These are the type of constructs which you use in cascading as well. For instance, over here, we are taking a line, we are splitting up using a regex parser, which comes inbuilt with cascading, and then we are passing it to a pipe to group the tokens, and then we are putting an aggregator on it to just count them. You see over here, our thinking is abstracted away from the low-level MapReduce key value pair type of stuff. Further, if you see in this slide, in the integration aspect, we are creating certain tabs. Now tabs in cascading parlance are the tools which allow you to talk to data sources and data things. Tabs are what allow your application to talk to the sources of information and things of information. Because you have a reusable tab, you can use it to connect to a different flow later on. On top, you have the configuration where you have configured this application to run on Hadoop. But it is very easy to change this line of code and say, oh no, I'm not going to run it on Hadoop. I'm going to test it locally and see how it performs. Okay, tomorrow some other framework might come in. Well, if I have the flow connector for it, I can just simply change this line of code and the code will execute on that platform unchanged. Lastly, the scheduling aspect. This is a very interesting aspect because we see that a flow has been connected using the Hadoop flow planner. But this flow is not executed unless you ask it to. So you can create a reusable library of flow and pass it around in your enterprise and have other developers use it. So the key takeaways are that you're not thinking in terms of MapReduce and cascading. You are using the familiar metaphors which you have learned during your initial data engineering tasks. Your flows are, are reusable, so you can, you, can, you can have a library of reusable components leveraging the best software engineering practices. As I was saying in the previous slide, you're not thinking in terms of MapReduce. Cascading models the entire world as a stream of tuples, which are scalar values coming out of a data source. You're then layering on filters, functions, aggregators, buffers, these reusable logic blocks on it, which transform the data according to your business needs. Cascading, because it was discovered in 2008 and has been deployed at so many enterprises, very use case driven, so we have a large library of components for you to use. If your enterprise requires a certain function which is not in cascading, it is very, very easy to write your own. There is only one method to override, which is operate, and it is very, very simple to roll your own operators and functions. So, so far we have talked about how easy it is to develop applications in cascading. But one must keep in mind that applications do not just run on Hadoop. They also need to talk to different data sources and data things. Because cascading is open source, 
people have been writing the data connectors, which we call TAPs, in Cascading World. There is a website, cascading.org slash extensions, which I encourage you to visit. It shows you all the different data connectors which are being built by Concurrent and by the community. Hence you see that cascading has become the de facto standard for big data application development. It allows you to build apps which are scale-free. Because we have so much experience in figuring out what patterns work and where they work, in which cases they are best, we allow you to write apps which are scale-free. You don't have to worry about the nitty-gritties of joins. We give you the logic blocks which you can use to construct your joins. You can easily leverage your existing Java developers without any big data experience. You can have them write a cascading app within a few hours of training. Because cascading is a Java API, it leverages years and years of software engineering best practices and test-driven development practices. It comes inbuilt with checks, traps, assertions, checkpoints, etc., which allow you to develop apps which are reusable, testable, and robust. You're not going to get a call at 3 a.m. in the morning because you were doing your data analysis using ad hoc scripts using cascading. Oh, sorry about this. There's just a lot of downloads going on in cascading, but let's talk about scalding, which is a layer of Scala or cascading which Twitter uses. Now, because cascading is Java API, you can actually provide your own DSL on top of it. A couple of them are in existence right now. One is Scalding, the other is Cascalog. Now, Scalding is a language binding to cascading for Scala. It is excellent for writing crisp mathematical construct for doing matrix math. Most of the revenue producing apps inside Twitter use Scalding under covers, and so does eBay. As I was saying earlier, not only do does cascading allow you to develop apps easily? It also allows you to integrate to different data sources. One of the key products around cascading is called Lingual. A Lingual is a SQL 92 layer on top of cascading. It's an extension to cascading which allows you to copy paste your ETL uh, workflows into cascading. So you don't have to give huge investment in migrating your workload from a former ETL based land to Hadoop. You can also use Lingual to connect to any data source which is JDBC compliant. So over here you have a powerful framework which not only allows you to accelerate data development, but it also allows you to integrate to other disparate data sources. Well, data, de data app development is fine, but once the app is up and running, you also want to monitor it. Because in enterprises, SLAs are everything. You cannot improve what you cannot measure. So you need a tool which can give you insight on how your application is performing at runtime. For this, we have a product called Driven. Driven allows you to look into how your application is constructed, what the DAG looks like, and how each of those constructs, you see the map reduce constructs in Hadoop, they execute certain cascading application blocks. So Driven allows you to see how your cascading, cascading app got mapped to a different mapper reducer, how much time each one took, and where you can operationalize your apps, where should you spend time in making your app faster. We'll come to that in a little bit. In summary, one can build really robust data apps right the first time with cascading. It allows you to intuitively think in metaphors which you have learned during your basic programming classes. Scalding is an extension to cascading using Scala, which allows you to develop crisp programming construct for matrix manipulation. Driven is an application visualization product which provides rich insights into how your application is executing at runtime so you can further bolster your application, debug it, etc. With that, I will pass on the controls to Ashish, which will take you through the Cubo part of the webinar. Thank you, Dhruv. Thanks for a nice overview of uh, cascading, which solves the problems of uh, programming aspect of MapReduce and getting away from uh, the complexity. So uh, uh, thank you for that. And here I'm going to take over, and I'll, I'll be talking about Cubo. So really quick, I, uh, my name is Ashish Tobey, and uh, I'm a solutions architect at Cubo. And today I'm going to talk about the other aspect, other pain point, uh, where uh, we deal with the infrastructure side. Uh, when, whenever you, you, any enterprise is, is in the plans for you know, setting up the larger infrastructure, there are a lot of dilemmas, a lot of problems, and 
we, we, we provide big data as a service, and I'll, I'll be talking about how it helps and why, why it is really helpful and it isn't, is a very strong alternative for you know, thinking about other traditional way of setting, up, setting things up on-premise. So uh, today's agenda would be, uh, I'll be touching upon the, the product, Kibol, and features architecture of Kibol, and then we'll walk through a quick demo, and I'll, I'll also try to show a real uh, sample of cascading app that how, how, can, uh, how can somebody run a cascading app with Kibol. So a uh, very quick overview of uh, Kibol. Uh, so Kibol is a company which was founded in 2011 by some of the pioneers of big data. Uh, industry, uh, Ashish Tusu and Jaydeep Singh Sarma, they are the founder, and, and they they were uh, they handled the entire infrastructure at Facebook, and also they were co-creator of Hive project, and Hive is another SQL-based uh, abstract layer on top of MapReduce, which solves the, you know uh, provides an abstraction at the SQL level. Uh, we we are funded by Lightspeed Ventures and Charles River, and we are based in Mountain View uh, as well as Bangalore, India. So uh, really quick, some service stacks. So we are in the production uh, since late 2012, and currently we are at the scale of uh, around 250,000 nodes every month. And uh, we, we are processing close to 30 petabyte data every month, which is growing uh, uh, rapidly. Uh, and, and it's kind of, it was like five petabyte in the January, and now you can see the, the scale, how it grew. Uh, we have the deployment in the, in the range of 10 nodes to 2,000 node clusters, so you can, Imagine like it's pretty much on the on the upper side of the industry uh, where you deal with 2,000 uh, node clusters level. Uh, so uh, that, that's kind of service stack. And this is uh, uh, now I'm going to talk about the goal of the company, and that's really important, and that kind of answers some of your questions, that what what your goal is and what services we provide. So our goal is to provide 100% managed services. And let me take a step back and talk about uh, what happens when when an enterprise try to set up. Uh, big data infrastructure, there's a lot of questions, a lot of discussions about what should be the cluster configuration, what should be the type of servers you, you're going to procure, and what, what, what is the right choice of machine type. Uh, that's a very uh, interesting part, and that's where a lot of enterprises make mistakes, and that's why, uh, I mean, that's a history of you know, some failures in the big data projects. And we, we are basically solving that problem by providing 100% managed service, where you don't really have to think about that aspect, you just have to sign in and, and just you're ready with your big data uh, analytics. So that's one goal. And second is uh, most, mostly in the industry, big data services are actually consumed by analysts or big data scientists. And they do not like to uh, really deal with day-to-day -day problems of Hadoop systems and uh, very internals of the system where you have to log in and see what process is scale, what is running, what is not running. So what we, we are targeting and we are solving the problem of you know, uh, the back end and providing a very nice UI on top so that data analysts and data scientists, they just have to deal with the UI. And pretty uh, intuitive UI, they can just log in and run their queries. They don't have to think about clusters, what clusters are running, where is my cluster running, what if my job tracker dies, what if my some component of my, my Hadoop cluster dies. We take care of everything automatically and replace things uh, do all the fault recovery and stuff like that. Uh, the third one is uh, the data SWAT team. So we provide a very great support from, from some of the experts in the industry. We have a very great experience and mature team where people come with more than a decade's experience and they, are, they have contributed with a lot of you know, uh, bigger systems like you know, Vertica or Greenplum. And uh, so we have those kind of folks who are supporting our services. So that's another goal and we are committed to that. So a uh, very uh, uh, kind of popular question by big data as a service, why shouldn't I think about other ways where I, 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 have, I, I can go with setting up my own clusters? And I partly answered that question in my uh, first slide, but there are a few key points. Uh, the time to deployment. So obviously, if you think about setting up a cluster of, say, just 10 nodes, I mean, it, it takes time. And uh, having experience of that part, I can say, like, it's not something you can do within, within like, few days. I mean, it might take a week or two weeks because there, there could be a lot of uh, issues with integration. And so uh, to, to make that system run, uh, run perfectly, it, it takes time. So that's one thing that with such kind of service uh, where Kibol can help you set up your, your clusters within a few minutes and you are ready with you know, uh, running your analytics. 
the second part is ease, ease of use. Uh, so basically, using such services, you can simply log into the UI which I was describing, and you can just start running your pipe queries or MapReduce jobs, cascading jobs. You can run your machine learning using Mahout. You can, you, can, you can pretty much leverage the entire ecosystem of Hadoop, like be it Uzi or uh, Scoop or any component you think about. It's pretty pluggable with keyboard environment, and you, you're ready within like minutes. Uh, third one is very, uh, it's, it's cost related. It reduces the risk. So when you, you think about setting these things within your premise, it, it, it is associated with a, with a huge cost. And if you make a wrong decision, and when you have to revert back the plans, it's kind of loss of money. Whereas in, in the big data as a service kind of model, you just pay as you go. And whenever you think that, okay, this is not a, this is not a compatible configuration for us, you can quickly change it within minutes, and you, you are kind of ready with another set of clusters, and you're not paying for anything which you did before, right? So that's another aspect, and that's a very great uh, key feature. That's why uh, the big data as a service is being popular, and it's helping industry in a big way. Uh, the last one is support. So obviously, when you uh, deploy things on premise, uh, the support is your, your responsibility. Obviously, uh, some of the vendors, they provide support, but that's also cost associated. Uh, uh, you, you have to pay for the support and things like that. So as a service model, you, 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 you are given the support by default, and, and that's kind of another virtue of this model. Uh, some of the core features and what distinguishes uh, Kubol from other competitors, other vendors uh, in the same space, and uh, 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 the first one, which is really, really important and is a, is a unique feature of Kubol, is auto scaling, and that's true of auto scaling. And I'll, I'll talk about a little bit like how it is, uh, how why did I say true auto scaling? So basically, uh, when you run a job and you your team runs runs multiple jobs, right? You don't have to really think about that how many machines I should be spending or uh, sparing on on this cluster. You you just simply go on, and in the beginning of you know your your configuration, you just set a range of machines that you can. Uh, according to your budget, you decide. So that range can be like five nodes to 200 nodes, and then we take care of everything. Let's say you, you're running a very high load, and we figure that out on the on the fly. And we, based on that calculation, we figure out that okay, you require 50 nodes at this time. So we basically expand your cluster, and it goes up to 50 nodes. And 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 imagine if some other team members have put some more load. I mean, it can automatically go up to 80 or up to your maximum limit, be it like 200 or 2,000. And that's where it, it basically provides a true auto-scaling of, uh, of feature. And uh, the another side is we also take care of the uh, scale-down feature. So when your load subsides and your, your team is almost done with, the, with their query, what we do, we automatically figure that out and we release those extra nodes so that you, know, you can save cost on the compute side. So that's why it is true auto-scaling. The second one is the fastest Hadoop running on the cloud. So uh, as you see the background of the, of the uh, company, how it was founded and who, who founded that. So these guys come from a very uh, uh, you know, uh, rigorous experience of big data, and they did a lot of optimizations, uh, keeping in mind uh, that you know, this is going to run on the cloud storage. Because fundamentally, Hadoop was built for HDFS layer. So those optimizations make our, our system very fast, and it's, it's the fastest Hadoop uh, in the cloud so far. And we also provide pre-built connectors, which kind of helps you uh, uh, connect to external data sources, your relational databases, and you can pull that data on a, on, a, on a common ground, which is your cloud storage. And then you can do all your analytics using tools like cascading, high pig, or anything. Uh, we also provide the job scheduler so that you, know, you don't have to worry about running your jobs manually. If there is a fixed ETL flow, you can simply uh, set up those uh, scheduler jobs and, and uh, we free about you know uh, taking pain off you know running those things manually. Uh, some additional features. So we basically consolidate all workloads into a single cluster. However, we we support multiple cluster notion as well. So you can create n number of clusters within your account. But uh, our uh, primary goal is to provide a single point of you know uh, execution where you can you can expand your cluster till any limit. That basically helps in terms of utilization because it's always you kind of. Uh, uh, Better in terms of uh, utilization, if you run 10 clusters of 10 nodes uh, compared to you know uh, 100 100 node clusters, a 100 node cluster kind of model basically gives you much more uh, performance, and it, it turns out to be a better choice. Uh, we we provide the mix and match reserved spot instances model so that you can leverage the spot instances of 
uh, clouds like AWS, and you can save save cost on that front. Uh, also, we provide the UI to you know explore the data and analyze the data, do some sampling. Uh, we also provide the ODBC data connectors so that you can pretty much connect uh, Kibol layer from your uh, from your BI tools like Tableau or any other tool like MicroStrategy, Pentaho, MSX, or anything. And all these functionalities are exposed through API, so you can pretty much integrate that part in the pro uh, in your programs, and you can you can call those APIs and and leverage the APIs. So this is a very uh, sort of consolidated architecture picture. Uh, and you see the at the center core, you see the pivot layer, which provides the auto scaling feature, job scheduling functionality, and workflows, which basically makes your ATL pipeline uh, uh, kind of which helps you set up the ATL pipelines, and also the external entities like BI tools on the one side. We provide the UI, so it's kind of a summary of what I, I just uh, talked about. Uh, we, we support the data connectors with uh, with external data sources that you can see on the side. So that's an overall summary of the entire uh, uh, conversation here. Uh, the last, uh, not the least, uh, so basically uh, I'll, I'll talk about a little bit about the architecture. So we have made sure that our architecture is pluggable so that any point in time if there is a new tool coming in, we can pretty much integrate with any tool. Uh, so, uh, or if you, if you want to install some libraries on, on your Hadoop cluster, which we do not do by default, you can do that. So we provide all these options so that you can you can manage the cluster from your side as well if you want to do some kind of third-party installations and stuff like that. We also provide the ways to uh, integrate with external tools like Cascading, Mahot, R, or, or Giraffe, or anything. I mean, it's, it's, it supports the entire ecosystem. And the shell command interface, which is one of the options on the UI, I'll, I'll cover that. But that kind of helps you run any sort of commands on your cluster, which basically enables the capability to run any type of integration, any type of you know, installation on your cluster. So that, that gives the flexibility of integrating things. So with that said, I'm going to quickly switch uh, my, uh, and, and share my desktop and, and show a very little demo. And uh, really quick, uh, I'll be sharing my desktop here. Hope you can see my screen. Uh, so that's our UI, which I was talking about. So you simply log in here, uh, and you land on a page where you will see the history of all my queries which I run. Uh, and on the left side, you can see all the jobs which I ran just, just now. On the right side of the of the window, you see the option of you know that's a composer, and you see the multiple options like you can run high query. Uh, you can you can also run the Presto query. So Presto is, is an in-memory engine which we support on the same box. So you don't have to go anywhere else. You just run the Presto query and figure out whether that works out well or not. Presto is not a solution for everything, but it works well for certain queries and compared to high provide you know around 5x to 10x kind of performance boost. You can run pick queries. You can you can pretty much run the shell command which I was talking about and and do whatever you know uh, operations you want to do. Uh, also, the MapReduce jobs, and I'll, I'll cover. I'll, I'll show how to run a cascading job. Uh, uh, also, we provide the data export and import capability, which I just talked about. That you can pretty much integrate from your external data sources, and you can do data export. So basically, you can run your uh, analytics on the high side and and populate the data sets into your uh, relational database, and vice versa. You can do data import as well. There is an option to run some DB query as well. So, for example, if you have an external data source say MySQL or Vertica, and you want to just do some kind of data discovery query. So you can select the DB query, and you can, you can run uh, some kind of count star or any type of query which you want to uh, sort of which, which will give you an idea of the data. Uh, and the very nice thing is the workflow which I talked about in, in the context of scheduling and the ETL pipeline setup. So what you can do is you can set up a workflow, and workflow is nothing but a heterogeneous flow of the jobs, which you can, you can, you can tie n number of jobs of different types, like first job is high, second job is big, and things like that, and you can run those, uh, those ETL uh, things. And you can also schedule on, on, the, uh, on, on this window I'm showing where you can set up the scheduled jobs and stuff like that, which, which will run on a certain period. So I'm not going to stress on that. Uh, we, we have those webinars every alternate week, so probably you can join that later. But right now, I'm going to show a really quick an example of cascading app. So this is my word count app with cascading code. And this is going to just give uh, some kind of word counts on the Ebro files. And I provided a jar location. It runs as a Hadoop job. So as you can see on top, uh, I selected Hadoop job. And this is my input, and that's my class name, which I, I wrote for uh, doing the word count. And this is my output directory. So that's where it's going to load the output. And I'm, I just need to run, press the button run, 
I don't need to really look at whether my cluster is up or not. Whereas you can actually see the cluster status from the top uh, drop down, and you see the green indicator, which basically tells that my cluster is up. But imagine if it, if it was not running, uh, this query kickoff will automatically bring it up. So you don't have to manually do that. And in the real time, you can see all the logs underneath. And also with the cascading, the, there's a nice thing called Driven, which uh, we'll be talking about very soon. But what it provides is a very nice picture of your MapReduce job in a form of traditional ETL jobs. So here on the cascading window, you see my word count is interpreted as a, uh, there is a green button which is a source, and there is a grouping uh, component, and there is an aggregator next. And at the end, there is a sync, which basically dumps the data into the uh, final location. So, and you can see all the stats, which we will be talking in the details, but you can see like tuple reads and stuff like that. You can also see the MapReduce picture, if, if you know about that. I mean, however, the cascading approach is, uh, you know, to remove that kind of, uh, and, and provide the abstraction at the level of uh, just uh, generic constructs, right? So uh, I'll let uh, Drup cover that part later, but uh, with that, uh, uh, I mean, you can also kind of look at the MapReduce side, like, you know, job tracker URL and stuff like that. So uh, on my job URL, you, you see uh, uh, there is a job tracker URL really quick. Or oh, anyways. Uh, so uh, yeah, that's pretty much it from the demo side, and uh, uh, I'll, I'll hand it over to Dhruv now, and he can probably go with a detailed, uh, you know, uh, driven demo from here. So let me drop back. Hey, Dhruv. Hey, thank, thanks a lot, Ashish. Uh, thanks for showing that beautiful uh, word count uh, app, how it runs on auto scaling Cubal cluster. So guys, I'm going to quickly take over from Ashish now and show you how driven looks like in a non-trivial app. You know, everyone likes work on, but let's see how it performs on a bigger scale. Yeah. So over here, I have the driven UI, which is showing a fairly complex app, which I ran locally on my laptop a couple nights ago. So as we were saying earlier, when you run your Hadoop job, basically the job, which is cascading app, you get a link um, in the logs which takes you, which if you go to that URL, it will take you to the driven server location, and you can see this DAG which is constructed. Now this DAG was not authored by hand. You know, this is not a sleight of hand. This was constructed by cascading when it was running on Hadoop. Uh, in this case, it was running locally on my box. As you see, this uh, complex app is constructed out of different flows. Uh, now these flows are from left to right are filter store, filter custom de demographics, et cetera, et cetera. Now, there are very, very interesting things on this the UI. For instance, as you can see, I can, I can go ahead and click each, uh, each, each, each uh, source and see what type of data was I collecting from it. Furthermore, I can go down and see what uh, type of logic block I can connected it with. So imagine you're a Java developer, you're writing your cascading app, but you want to quickly visualize how it's going to look like, whether you're making any mistakes or not. So you can run your, you can do your app development. You can quickly run it in local mode, and it's going to give you a link which you can go to and visualize it. So this becomes very powerful for logical analysis when you're creating your application. Now this is the end product. So this is after the whole application was was run on Hadoop. Now over here we see that it also shows me how much time each of these logical blocks took for execution. So for instance, the filter store logical block took one minute and 23 seconds. Not only that, it also shows me how much time did the filter store block took in the submitted portion. So when you, when you submit this job to the Hadoop cluster, the jobs are waiting in line to, for their turn. So you can see that the filter store operational block, logically speaking, spent a bunch of its time just because it was waiting for its turn to get executed. Now, this is because my laptop is small. I can only run that many map, map and reduce tasks at the same time. But if you were to run in, a, in an actual cluster, it would be faster. Further, we can drill down on each of these logic blocks, and we can see how it gets mapped to an actual map reduce job. So for instance, this is a straight pass-through operation, so this only requires us to have a mapper. So you can see that this particular flow got mapped to only one mapper. And furthermore, it also shows me how many slices this job took. Now slices in cascading parlance or driven parlance means the, the map or reduce task running in parallel. Over here, there were two map mappers which are run in parallel, so there are two slices. I can go in and look at what runtime was associated with each. 
Because it's a fairly even distribution, I'm not too worried. I'm saying that, okay, well, both of these tasks took the same amount of time, so you know, there's not much room for improvement here. If I parallelize it, maybe it'll run faster. Now, there are some default counters which this UI shows you. It shows you the runtime, the read duration, tuple thread, but you can easily add more counters to it. For instance, you can go inside and you can see, okay, well, because I was using a file output format, I can see the bytes written. And if I click on that, I now get a different column with bytes written. Not only that, I can push down my Hadoop custom counters into this UI as well, because all the cascading app is doing at runtime is sending out metadata to the backend driven server. Now, this becomes very powerful when you talk about application monitoring at runtime, because you know because you know how much time each particular logic block is taking, you know where to go inside and, and optimize your job. In fact, in one of our customers' cases, they came to us saying that, okay, well, can you help us optimize this job? And we were like, okay, well, let's pull up Driven. And when we looked at Driven, it became very clear that one of the filtration processes, which they were doing right at the end, it could be moved out to the front without any loss in the business logic. So this is a very quick overview of what Driven gives you. And it, you can use cascading without Driven, but Driven is free to download, and you can, you can test drive it, you can see how it performs, and then you can get in touch with us if you need more support. So that's a quick Driven demo from my side, Ashish. Yeah. Thanks, Drove. That was wonderful. Uh, and uh, now, now we're, we're opening up for the questions and answers. So uh, I see a bunch of questions in the pipeline. So probably Ali can uh, drive that session, and we can take those questions one after another. Ali, uh, over to you. Great, thank you guys. <clears throat> so we have a couple of questions in and some more coming in as we speak, but um, let's kick it off with the first question for Drew. Uh, somebody asks, cascading seems similar to pig uh, slash hive. Uh, could you please compare cascading to pig slash hive? And for example, what do I get from both cascading and pig and hive? What does cascading give me that pig and hive does not? Uh, that's a great question, and that's a very pertinent question as well. Um, so pig is a scripting language, right? And so is hive. And they're both very useful for ad hoc analysis of data. Pig, hive, and cascading, all three abstract your thinking away from attributes. But however, for production-grade applications that produce data product, application logic that is built on stringing together a sequence of script, it's very, very bad. For instance, it is not possible to develop and debug real-world applications. Now, Pig and Hive are scripting languages. They are tough to deploy and even tougher to monitor and tune as the applications mature. Now, when it comes to app development, both Pig and Hive are shortcomings when dealing with complexity and testing. With Pig and Hive, easy problems can be easily solved, right? So you can, have, you can start your app development, and it's uh, easy to start at first. But as the complexity grows, it becomes really, really hard to monitor, debug, and diagnose your app. So I think that's a, that's a short comparison between pig cascading and hive. Great. Um, moving on, um, question for the both of you, I suppose. Uh, what version of cascading does the Kubel cluster use, and is driven dependent on certain cascading versions? Sure. So I'll take the first part, and then I'll let, let move on to the second one. So. As I mentioned while I was uh, showing the, uh, the slide deck, we have a very applicable architecture. It's not sticky in nature. So what that means is we support any version of cascading. I have, personally, I have run, uh, run my programs using cascading 2.0 as well as 2.5.5. So that's pretty open, very flexible. You can compile those things, and we are compatible. So we run those compatible D suites uh, and make sure that we are 100% compatible. The second part to do. Yeah. So we GA driven last month, and that runs beautifully on 2.5, but we have backwards compatibility, compatibility with 2.1, cascading 2.1. Uh, someone asks uh, generally, how do you support OpenStack? OK, I'll take that. So uh, with Kubol, uh, so far we are in the production with AWS Cloud as well as Google Cloud. 
we have done the piloting work with OpenStack, but we do not have any any customer on OpenStack. But we have done uh, the we, we have a flexible architecture internally we have designed. So we kind of kept in mind uh, and, and we, uh, we, we kind of make sure that we, we will support OpenStack whenever it comes. Also, we are in the, in the, in the sort of, uh, we have other clouds in our roadmap. So sooner you might hear from us that like Windows Azure or, or some other clouds, we are still evaluating and we'll be rolling out the support for other clouds as well. I hope that answers. Great. Uh, this next question back to Drew. Um, how does one use Driven to identify specifically what may be causing a bottleneck in a workflow? That's an excellent question. Uh, so when I showed you the Driven UI, I showed you how the logical DAG gets mapped or gets translated into map and reduce. So that is we, we call that the runtime view. So you can drill down into that portion of Driven UI, and you can easily see which logic of your application is executing on which map reducer, and furthermore, how much time it is taking. So using that, you can easily see, okay, well, this, this logic block is taking a long time. Well, why is it taking a long time? Is it because I don't have enough resources in my cluster? Or is it because I'm doing a data manipulation which is probably not needed here? So that way you can easily optimize your job using Driven, and you can also further improve on your SLA needs. Great. Uh, back to Ashish here. Um, someone asks, how does auto scaling work with Cubal? All right. Yeah, that's a that's a wonderful question, and I love to answer that question. So thanks for asking. Uh, so auto scaling is a very unique feature, and what happens typically uh, when when you run any sort of job, be it cast high or big or anything, it actually gets interpreted into MapReduce program, right? So it gets submitted to the cluster, and then it gets split into multiple mappers. It could be, depending upon the data size, it could be like hundreds of mappers, thousands of mappers, tens of mappers. And what we do in, in, in the back end, Kibol Engine keeps, keeps an eye, keeps monitoring the progress of your each mapper, and we also see that, okay, uh, how many machines you have in your clusters, and every machine, every node has the capability to run a fixed number of mappers depending upon what is the slot setting. So depending upon that, we see that how many mappers are in the queue and how many are running, how they are progressing. Based on all this, we do some mathematical calculation. We do some have some algorithms and figure that out that, okay, now this is not sufficient. This is not going to deliver your, your job results within the, the time which you expect. There, that's the point. That's where we basically uh, get that number that, okay, you need extra number of nodes like 40 or 50 or whatsoever. And then we also keep, keep check that what is your maximum setting which you have done in the beginning. So we never go beyond that. And for example, the, the, the number which we evaluated and say the 40 nodes, if it is within your maximum number of nodes. We will spin up those nodes on the fly. So after a few minutes, you will see that your, your cluster size has grown up, and now your mappers are running much more faster. There's no queue. Queue is really clearing very fast. And that's how we deal with auto scaling. And the same thing happens when your cluster is going on the idle side. It's not running so many uh, mappers. And so what we do, we keep checking the same thing again and again, that there are engines running in the back end. And we do the same thing. We figure out that how many nodes are sitting idle if they are pretty much have no dependency on the data sitting on their HDFS layer, we start tearing down those machines as well. So that's how the scaling up and scaling down actually uh, happens in the, in the back end. Hope that answers the question. Ali, do we do we have uh, more questions? Hey guys, can you hear me? Yep. A little audio difficulty here. I apologize. Um, we just had a question come in, um, and it's uh, is there a API or a command line interface to programmatically construct and launch a cascading job periodically, like we can with the AWS CLI? That be for Drew. So cascading uh, is a Java API, right? So you're going to write your application using 
Java programming language, you're going to construct it in IDE, you're going to test drive it locally, see everything works, see it in driven. And then when you are ready, you can use any external tool to push it out to the CLI of AWS. Or in case of Kubel, I think I yeah. you might be able to answer that. Right, right. right. So uh, as I mentioned while uh, on one of my slide deck, uh, slide, so we, we do provide the, the API support. So using that API, uh, since cascading job when I showed it, it was it was it was it ran as a Hadoop job, right? And we do support those jobs to be kicked off from API. So you can pretty much use cascading jars and you can kick off those jobs. So yes, the answer is yes. You can using Kubol, you can do that. And since uh, we, we support scheduling as well, so you can put those scheduler on uh, and with some certain periodicity, and that's how you can run those on a, on a schedule. So you can call on the Kubol API and have the jar submitted to your cluster. Absolutely, okay. absolutely, yeah, right. And we have the, our right. SDK published at the, at the Python uh, forum, so you can pretty much download that and send send the questions. Uh, we can provide the support how to do that. Great. Um, a Kubel question here for Ashish, um, and it asks, we have data sitting on our on-premise cluster. Can I use Kubel to process that data? All right. Uh, the answer is yes and no. And the good thing is that there is a, there is a yes. So basically, uh, when, when you deploy uh, and you run Kubel, the prerequisite is that that you have to have your data on the cloud storage. In case of AWS, it, it should be S3. In case of Google Cloud, it should be Google Storage. Uh, the answer, why it is yes? So let's assume you have data sitting on your uh, your on-premise HDFS clusters. You can pretty much use uh, Hadoop this CP command, or there are other other tools available. You can transfer the data and put it on the S3, and that's where you're you're ready to start, you know, uh, running Kubel against that data. So that that's the way many of our customers, when they onboard, they they did the same exercise, and that's how they started. Great. Uh, another question for Drew here: uh, Where would one use Hive relative to cascading? I would say that just to start out with your data analysis, if you feel comfortable with just a command line interface and basic scripting, Hive's all right. But as soon as you get past that initial stage, then you want to operationalize your data apps, you want to have the comfort that you have created a robust app which can run at scale, you'll move to cascading. And I would, in fact, go on to say that with Lingual, which allows you to take your existing ETL uh, workload and migrate to cascading, you should just start off with Lingual for your exploratory data analysis. Great. Uh, one final question here, um, and I believe this one is directed towards Ashish again. Uh, and it asks, how do I compare Presto with Impala or Spark? All right, that's a very interesting question. It's a very, very difficult question, though. Uh, so, okay, let me give you a little background. So Presto, Impala, Spark, uh, they're trying to solve the same problem, actually. And they come from different, you know, uh, different companies, different development uh, efforts uh, in the back end. And they're trying to solve the same problem. We adopted Presto because uh, it comes out of uh, Facebook and it, it is in production. Uh, they are running it on, on thousands of nodes every day. They are, uh, so that's where we believe that it is tried and tested. Uh, the model is in memory processing. So what it tries to do, it, it kind of, it is not a map reduced model. And MapReduce, since it comes with a with a classic problem of latency, so that's what it is trying to address. Uh, it's not a solution for everything. It's not a replacement for all the tools like high MapReduce, cascading, or anything. It's a, just another tool, and you need to decide that, okay, this is my workload which runs really, really fast with Presto. Like some of the basic discovery type of queries, like you know, you want to see your uh, some of the trends of you know maximum and the order wise, who who is who is the most uh, you know, trend customer or something like that. Those kind of queries which you want to do for your uh, data discovery, those are the queries run faster uh, and very well on Presto and I believe on Spark and Impala as well. So they're trying to solve the same problem, but yeah, we do support Presto on our platform without doing any integration work, and we are in the process of you know evaluating Spark as well. Great. Thank you so much for that. And uh, with that, uh, this webinar comes to a close.
Um, a very sincere thank you again to everyone who joined us today. Uh, as I mentioned before, uh, look out for a follow-up email from us with a link to an on-demand version of this webinar. Uh, please feel free to send it out to whomever else you feel might be interested in this. Um, and also look out for our forthcoming webinars. We do this monthly, and uh, we really appreciate your interest in joining us again. So with that, have a fantastic day, folks, and we look forward to hearing from you soon.